Okay, so part three, um, this is the development of Bragg's Law. So if you look at this relationship, um, the, the energy drop is equal to uh, Planck's constant times the, uh, the frequency. Then you can express, and you can express frequency in terms of the speed of light, which is C, and the wavelength, which is lambda. And there's, and there's a joke, right? Someone says, hey, what's new? You can say, well, it's C over lambda. Anyway, um, if, you, if you combine equations one and two, then you can express the energy drop in terms of, like I was saying, Planck's constant, speed of light, and wavelength. And so then you can rearrange this as uh, wavelength is equal to Planck's constant, speed of light, okay, those are constants, divided by the energy drop. And so what does that mean? It means the characteristic x-rays that we were talking about have not just a specific energy drop, they also have a specific wavelength. And so if we go back to um, this plot uh, with the continuous uh, uh, x-ray uh, radiation, then we have these characteristic x-rays. So we have the k-alpha and we have the k-beta. This is expressed in terms of wavelength. Then we find that if you have a high delta E, high energy drop, then you'll have a lower wavelength. And if you have a lower energy drop, you'll have a higher wavelength. And so if you think about um, an X-ray energy spectrum, the EDS spectrum, it's the exact inverse, not the exact, but it is an inverse uh, in comparison with a, with a wavelength um, spectrum. Okay, so remember von Lau, uh, and he's a guy who determined, among other things, that X-rays are, are diffracted. Uh, if you remember, the atomic spacings are on the order of the X-ray wavelength. And so the idea here is that you can use an X-ray wavelength spectrum to identify the spacings among atoms. The atomic spacings are different among minerals. And so you can then use the X-ray wavelength spectrum to identify minerals. And the way that you do this is you go to the Braggs. So let's get a, a, just a, a couple of um, concepts down before we, we get into the geometry of Bragg's Law. Um, so first of all, if you uh, filter that spectrum, right? So you go back to a spectrum like this, it's got these characteristic x-rays. You can filter it so that you get just one x-ray energy. Okay, that's important. So you have a, a fixed wavelength x-ray that you can produce. Typically what we use in um, X-ray diffractometers is copper K-alpha. It has a wavelength that is 1.54 angstroms, happens to correspond with eight kiloelectron volts. Now, if you have two uh, X-rays, any kind of electromagnetic radiation that are lined up with each other, so they are, um, so that the peaks match the peaks and the troughs match the troughs, then you get what's called constructive interference. So it has the same wavelength, but it has a higher amplitude. And if they're offset, so the peak in one hits the trough of another, and the peak of the, this other hits the trough of the first, then you get what's called destructive interference, and then you don't get any signal at all. So they cancel each other out. So constructive interference, same wavelength, increased amplitude. Destructive interference cancels out decreased amplitude. So now let's uh, let's develop Bragg's law. The Bragg's law is basically a condition of constructive interference. So now let's consider a crystal. Okay, that's the surface, and at a distance d below it, it's called the d spacing. There's another plane of atoms. So a plane of atoms along the crystal surface, and another plane of atoms, uh, just the next plane down, just below the surface. So if we have an X-ray that is incident, so we're going to have this blue, and it reflects off, so now it's an orange X-ray, then it gets, um, it, there's a mirror image. So the X-ray is coming in, it has a wavelength lambda, it is impinging on the surface, 
striking the surface at angle theta, and it reflects off just like a mirror. So it reflects off at the same angle theta, has the same wavelength, um, but it's the mirror image. Okay, so here, this is the, the first x-ray that we were talking about that reflects off the surface. Well, the same thing can happen underneath it. You can have the same in, in, in sync uh, x-ray coming in, hits this plane of atoms, reflects off, same wavelength, mirror image. Now you go to the next x-ray underneath that, the next plane of atoms underneath it, an x-ray comes in, same wavelength, reflects off, same wavelength, mirror image. And so this is going to happen plane after plane after plane after plane. So what the Braggs developed was a condition of constructive interference. And, and basically what it says is that here is our first x-ray that comes in, reflects off. This other x-ray that's coming in and reflecting off of the next lower plane has to go a little extra distance. So this distance from the source is the same as this distance, and this distance out here is the same as this distance. So this x-ray is going a little bit longer, a little bit farther to get to the reflection point, and it goes a little bit farther off in this direction, exactly the same amount. Okay, so if you want these two rays to interfere constructively with each other, then this distance has to be equal to some fraction of a wavelength. And it turns out that here they are, they're coming in. Here's the reflection point for the upper ray. Here is the reflection point for the next ray. So this one is reflecting and comes out with this shape. This one is coming in. If the distance, this extra distance from the, uh, the upper reflection point to the next reflection point is equal to lambda over 2, then these two rays will constructively interfere. So the intensity will, will go up. So now let's just uh, take a step back. So constructive interference always does what? And it always increases the amplitude. Doesn't necessarily double it and will not do anything to the wavelength. Okay, so what we looked at before was that if this extra distance is lambda over 2, then you get constructive interference. So what happens if lambda, if that extra distance is lambda over 4? What if this distance is lambda over 4? So here's our x-ray coming in, doo -doo -doo, reflects off this point, okay, so now we have a reflected ray. If this one comes in and it goes only a quarter of a wavelength, and then we reflect it, well then these absolutely uh, are, are completely mismatched. So they will destructively interfere. So if this extra distance is lambda over 2, they constructively interfere. If it's lambda over 4, they completely destructively interfere. And so if you start thinking about this geometrically, what you'll realize is that constructive interference will occur when the extra distance is any multiple of lambda over 2. And so here's our reflective reflection point at lambda over 2, and these constructively interfere. Here it is at 2 lambda over 2, it's just lambda, those constructively interfere. 3 lambda over 2, those constructively interfere. So constructive interference occurs when that extra distance that it travels is equal to n lambda over 2, where n is an integral. So now let's, um, let's figure out what that, what that distance is. Okay, so this is our extra distance. We said it's n lambda over 2 to the reflection point. And this is the extra distance that it has to travel. That's by, by uh, symmetry that has to be n lambda over 2. And so this extra distance that it travels through here is n lambda over 2. n lambda over 2 is equal to n lambda. But we also know something about this distance in terms of the angle, the incident angle, theta. By geometry, if this is perpendicular, 
if this is a perpendicular, then this angle has to be theta. And this is perpendicular, so that's a right angle. And we know the distance, this is d. And then why is it d? Because we defined it to be d. It's, it's called the d spacing. And so if you do the trigonometry, you'll find out that this distance is d sine theta, and this distance is d sine theta. So the extra distance in terms of d and theta is equal to 2d sine theta. So if these, are, these two distances are equal to each other, then n lambda has to be equal to 2d sine theta. And that's what Bragg's law is. You should commit this to memory. n lambda equals 2d sine theta. So now let's do a, a, a quick, uh, quick little calculation here. So if we have copper k alpha x-ray, so lambda is 1.54, and we have a d spacing of one angstrom, uh, at what angle theta would constructive interference occur? Let's just, just say n is equal to 1. Okay, so that's the equation we want to use. And the answer is 50, a little over 50 degrees. Now it's possible to miscalculate this. So if you calculated 44.1 degrees, um, that means that you did not take the inverse sign. You just looked at the ratio. And if you calculated 39.9 degrees, that means that you took the sign, you didn't take the inverse sign. Okay, so if we go back to that equation, n lambda 2d sine theta, be sure that you take a lambda divided by 2, the d spacing, and then taking the inverse sign. Okay, so at this point, um, with some review, uh, I would hope that, given a diagram, uh, that you could uh, derive Bragg's Law. Okay, let's talk about some practical applications. Okay, so this is what an x-ray uh, diffractometer, there's a couple of different varieties, but this is an example there's an x-ray source here, the sample sits here, and there's an x-ray detector over here. And so what happens is, um, in, in the old days, they, they, there was a different um, setup, but in modern systems, the x-ray source moves up in this direction, and the detector moves up in this direction by the same angle. So here the x-rays are coming in at, whatever it is, 30 degrees, bouncing off, reflecting 30 degrees into the x-ray detector. So the incident angle is 30 degrees. This can rotate down. So now let's say it's 10 degrees, at the same time that this rotates down 10 degrees. And so you can get an angle that's 10 degrees. Or these can rotate up, and you can get angles that are 70, 80 degrees. So what happens is you, you set the source and the detector at very low angles, and then you continuously move them simultaneously to higher and higher angles, and you measure the um, count rate on the, uh, the X-ray detector as the angle is increasing from low angles to high angles. Right, so that's what I was just talking about, that, that these two uh, arms move at the same rate, uh, at the same angular rate, um, continuously. Now, for historical reasons, uh, the measurements are recorded as 2 theta, degrees 2 theta. And the reason for that is that for a long time it was difficult to move an x-ray source, much easier to move a detector and a sample. And um, so the detector ended up being recording, recording its position in terms of 2 theta. Don't worry about that. It's, it's it's historical. Um, what you do is, if you want to solve Bragg's law and you have some um, theta, two, uh, two theta that has been recorded, two theta of 45 degrees, say, um, and you want to solve Bragg's law, you take that two theta value, 45 degrees, and divide by two, 22.5 degrees, and now you solve Bragg's law for whatever it is that you're trying to solve it for. But just be aware, 
that when X-ray diffraction uh, uh, patterns are recorded um, in, in this kind of X-ray uh, diffractometry, um, they are recorded as two theta. And so you have to take that into account. Just divide by two to get theta. So here's an example. Um, a lot of times people use powder X-ray diffractometry. Um, and basically you just powder it, stick it on a slide, move the source and the detector in opposite directions continuously, and you measure the intensity. So here's the X-ray diffraction pattern for Rutile. Uh, this is taken off the rough database. Um, and so you can see there are these different two theta angles, which are here. So this one is, I don't know what that is, 28 degrees, 3.24 angstroms, 37 degrees, 2.48, on and on and on, 70 degrees, 1.36, 69 degrees. So if you want to solve Bragg's law, m lambda equals 2d sine theta, you would take this angle, 69 degrees, divide by 2, 34.5 degrees. And then if you know the wavelength of the incident um, uh, x-ray, it's copper k alpha, it's 1.54. Um, then you could calculate the, the d spacing, the spacings of the atoms would be 1.36. Just a, just a brief digression. Um, you can also do single crystal x-ray diffraction, and, and there what you're doing is you're, you're shining um, the x-rays onto a single crystal, and what happens there is that you get a whole series of diffractions um, that show up as spots. And the distance among the spots tells you about the, the spacing of the atoms, how far apart they are, and then the symmetry of the spots tells you something about the crystal system. If you go into crystallography, this is, this is a great technique, and, and you can learn a lot about crystals from this. Um, but just to say that it's not just powder X-ray diffraction. Um, there's also single crystal X-ray diffraction. Okay, so a question here. Rutile, which is tetragonal, we'll talk about what crystal system that is later, um, has a composition of TiO2 and anatase, same crystal system, and brookite in a different crystal system that have the same composition. So given that information, what would you predict about their spectra? And it turns out they're all really different. They are all really different. And um, here, I'll just show you where that is. So now this is also from the rough database. So anatase is orange, brookite is brown, rutile is blue. And so I've picked out the most intense peaks here. So blue, 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 blue is rutile, brown, 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 brown is, is brookite, orange, 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 orange is anatase. And you can see um, some of the peaks kind of line up. There's, there's some similarity there. But you know, there's no blue peaks in here. Um, there's there's nothing out here in the orange and, and uh, brown peaks, they're, they're little tiny things. Um, and so um, it turns out that even minerals that have the same composition, they can even be in the same crystal system, can have very, very different X-ray diffraction patterns. So even if you knew the chemistry, it's TiO2, you wouldn't necessarily know what mineral it is, but the X-ray diffraction pattern would tell you anatase, brookite, etl. One thing that people use um, X-ray diffraction for is to determine proportions of, of minerals. A lot of times it's clays, um, but you have to have um, very well standardized um, spectra. And so, for example, here is an X-ray spectrum of clays, copper K alpha, X-ray source, angles two theta, four, three and a half to 30. And you can see there are all of these different peaks here, pretty broad peaks. Um, this is just an untreated specimen. This one has been glycolated, so you add ethylene glycol to it. And for some clays, they're swelling clays, and so they will spread apart when you add ethylene glycol to them. And then if you heat it, then you get um, a different spectrum. Some clays are like whatever peak that is, uh, it's very susceptible to heating. Some clays are very susceptible to heating. 
And so what, the way that you go about this is that you measure the spectrum for um, end member clays. Uh, so this is illite. Illite is a, a clay that doesn't swell. So if you look at the blue curve and the green curve, blue curve and green curve, all of these peaks are in the same position. Okay, so it's not a swelling clay. So if you measure a peak out here and you add ethylene glycol to it and it doesn't move, it, it could be illite. That would be a characteristic of illite. It's also not affected by heating. So heating 400, 550 degrees, these curves, these peaks are not moving. You're losing a little intensity on those peaks, but the, the, this peak is also not moving. Now, if you look at kaolinite, kaolinite also doesn't swell. Okay, so these peaks are not, are not moving around in position, but they are. it is affected by heating. And so if you look at this purple line, heated to 550 degrees, there's no longer a peak here. So that's how you can tell that this peak would correspond with kaolinite. And then last, there's um, montmorillonite, usually called smectite, and that one is swell, that does swell. So as you take an untreated peak, the blue one, you add ethylene glycol to it, it swells, a larger despacing gives you a smaller angle. So the peak moves, and then it's also susceptible to heating. And so this, these peaks are, um, this peak is, is this peak that's been shifted over to the right, and it's gotten much, much smaller. So now what you do is you look at a complex spectrum like this, and you look at it as the untreated spectrum, and you look at uh, what happens when, it's, when it, you add glycol to it, and you look at it at what happens when you heat it. And so, for example, you look out here, these are completely unaffected by ethylene glycol. So these are, this is an illite peak and a kaolinite peak. This one is entirely a kaolinite peak because as you heat it, it disappears. And this peak over here, this is the smectite peak. Um, so because as you add ethylene glycol, it shifts over to the left. And so by applying these standards, I can, I can pick apart, here's the spectrum for illite and its behavior with respect to um, swelling and heating. Kaolinite, how it behaves with respect to swelling and heating, smectite, same thing. I can take a complex spectrum like this, I can split it up into the contributions of the three different components. And if I do this right, I can come up with the proportions of smectite, illite, and kaolinite. Now, why would we want to know that? Well, it turns out smectite is a big problem um, for geoengineering. Um, so this is an area that's right next to Boise. And there's some basaltic rocks there. The weathering of basalt creates a lot of smectite. And the smectite, because it swells when it, when, it, um, when it gets wet in the springtime, then the hill slope steepens up. And when it dries out in the summertime, the hill slope um, flattens back. And so what you're looking at is that, that that swelling and shrinking and swelling and shrinking has caused this hill slope to become destabilized and it started a little mini landslide right here. So this whole sheet of material has detached and is starting to slide downhill. And it turns out there was a housing complex that was built on this hill slope. And so you can see here the pavement is starting to crack because the whole hill slope has become um, unstable because of smectites. And you know, you would not want to live in this house. You can tell the, the whole thing is uh, is uh, starting to, to be uh, broken apart. That was, the, that was smectite. Um, there's another type of clay that's very susceptible to, its strength is very susceptible to salt content. Um, so uh, it's called quick clay. And let me show you a, a, a landslide in um, Norway uh, just this earlier this, this summer, I'm making this in 2020. And let me just show you what happens. Okay, so that is a whole sheet of land that is sliding out into the fjord because it's underlain by quick clay. And the poor fluid chemistry in the quick clay uh, changed. 
destabilized the slope and the whole thing just slid out into the field. Okay, so this is a little elderly uh, video, um, but it shows the effect of, uh, of quick clay, what stabilizes it, and then um, uh, how it can catastrophically fail. In its natural undisturbed state, quick clay exhibits considerable strength. However, if the load becomes too heavy, as shown in this example, a failure takes place as the clay particle structure collapses followed by remolding of the clay. The most characteristic feature of a quick clay is the complete and drastic change of consistency by remolding. Such extreme quick clay behavior is encountered only when the salt concentration in the pour water drops below one gram per liter. To illustrate the important role of salt on the material properties, we can add a little ordinary table salt to the clay sample. When the salt goes back into the pore water, the salt ions alter the interaction between the minerals and the pore water. The remolded strength increases dramatically and the clay is no longer a liquid. So what happens is the, um, the clays are uh, deposited in a marine setting, so they have high sodium content. Um, and then as the glaciers melt away, um, isostatic rebound brings them up above the sea level. And so there's lots of fresh water, right? The plains and, and that water uh, makes its way through the clay, removes the salt. And so with time, the quick clay gets weaker and weaker and weaker until it can catastrophically fail, like I showed in that video. So um, now I would, uh, just to recap, uh, I would hope that you could explain how x-rays are, are formed um, and uh, how we can use energy dispersive spectrom spectroscopy to identify minerals, uh, to be able to derive Bragg's Law, and then to talk about some of the practical applications for the use of x-ray diffraction patterns, identifying minerals and distinguishing proportions of clays. Some clays are, are, uh, are important to identify.